At Mega Health, they believe leaders can transform productivity, overall organizational health, and the growth of their business by, wait for it, by making wellness contagious. We're about to find out just how contagious this is going to spread all over LinkedIn, all over the internet with our guest who has received the United Way Appreciation and Recognition Award back from 2014. She won the KW Oktoberfest Woman of the Year Award. Please welcome to the Leadership Standard, Robin Bender. Hi, thank you so much. Great to be here. Well, it's fascinating as we were saying, full disclosure, just before we went on live, uh, I have no idea where this particular topic around um, mega health at work, what you do, but also the issue of mental health and making wellness contagious. I think that's the thing that's sparking me, uh, Robin. Uh, great place to start. Let's, let's dispense with all the niceties. We'll get personal later. How? I'm sure there are leaders everywhere that want to know, how do you make wellness contagious? Well, it's interesting. So you really, you begin with yourself. And what that means is it's all about looking after your own well-being and recognizing how your mental health influences others um, in a leadership position. It's truly critical that we are looking after our overall well-being, our overall self, in order to be able to positively influence other people. And if we're not doing that, it very much shows up everywhere around us, not only in a workplace, but within our families, within our communities. Um, you know, all the interactions that we have with people are really a reflection as to whether we are keeping ourselves well. And by doing that, we are able to make wellness contagious with other people, because why? People wanna feel good. They want good mental health. And in a workplace, why is it so important? Well, because being healthy and being happy makes for greater productivity. So it only makes sense that when people are feeling better, feeling happier, looking after themselves, that this is a feeling that spreads no matter where you are. How does this effort that you're spearheading, Robin, differ from what so many motivational parrots talk about? You know, the motivational... Um, people who blow sunshine and lollipops and rainbows and unicorns and be optimistic no matter what. How is this approach that you're taking different? Well, I think the difference is taking the time to really look at how we think, how we act, and how we feel. And in science, there's a name for this, and it's called metacognition, which means to think about what we think about. And I think that's the difference. So many people go throughout their day, they're busy, they have their to-do lists, they're chucking through you know, all the things that they need to get done. But often we don't stop and think about what we're doing. And what, we, what happens is we start to run on what's called autopilot. And this is where organizations can completely change uh, you know, how they approach business um, in itself. Because if, if you look at processes within an organization, let's say, if we don't stop and take a step back and say, does it make sense to keep doing this, what we're doing? Is it productive? Is it efficient? If we don't do that, then we get stuck on this auto doing. Here's where the opportunity lies. If we actually stop, take a step back, and say, are we doing the things that keep us well and productive at the same time? Because everyone benefits when we consider both into the equation. But what I find happens in so many organizations is we get busy with the doing that we rarely take the time to step back and say, does it make sense any longer? Is it healthy? Is it productive? Are we getting the results that we're looking for? And ultimately, when you make these shifts with it at the individual level and you know, throughout the organization, you start to see productivity increase as happiness and health increases with every single individual. So just right out of Jerry Maguire, you, you had me, Robin, at metacognition and science. Okay. Yes. Now, yes. what story could you share that illustrates 
those points in real life business terms, Spe a specific example, if you will, where this philosophy rubber really hit uh, the organizational road. Right. So I've, t I mean, I've worked with many organizations where this is really the first step and it's taking the time to stop. And again, think about what we're doing. The model works when we take this metacognition and apply it, not just in our own well-being, but in the systems and in the processes and in the policies that we are implementing and creating. So a good example is, you know, when somebody um, in, in an organization where somebody does something and they've made a mistake or they've messed up, what I've often seen is organizations will take a blanket approach and they'll want to implement a policy in order to deal with that particular circumstance to make sure that it doesn't happen again, instead of dealing with the particular individual in how they think, how they act and how they feel. So what you see happen is when situations arise, organizations are trying to deal with it by implementing processes that apply to everyone when one particular person's thoughts actions and behaviors actually cause the situation. So this is where the science of metacognition can really benefit an organization and not just blanketing the organization with policies that now only really need to be tailored to one person. This is where you know organizations can save a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of communication, a lot of trying to change a whole bunch of people when really the focus needs to be on one particular individual in sitting down and looking at how were they thinking, acting, and feeling in that moment. And do we need to re-educate them to think, act, and feel differently in order to have a better outcome? Because here's the thing that I've witnessed. When, when businesses put these blanket policies in place because everybody knows the one person who made the mistake or acted and behaved in a way that was not lined up with the values of the organization, you are not making wellness contagious in that, those moments. You're saying to everyone, look, now we need to blanket the policy so all of you are on board and what that one particular person did will not happen with everyone else, right? So this is, this is where you can see it's changing at the individual level and dealing with it at that level that then ripples throughout the organization, if that makes sense. Well, and I'm chuckling a little bit because I'm reminded of what our friend, uh, friend of the show, Don Schmincke said that it's like the sitcom, The Office. It's not a sitcom, it's a documentary. Already I'm thinking about how the one mistake, the Michael Scotts of the world haul the whole team. What, it, what, what it, what's that line? B boardroom now, everyone. Is that, is that really illustrating what you're talking about, Robin? Very much so. Very much so. So we want to deal with people at the individual level that then ripples out throughout the organization. But if we're not acknowledging how people are thinking, acting, and feeling at this very basic level, and this I see this happen all the time because we are so busy. We're so busy doing that we don't take the time within organizations to stop and think about what we're actually doing. I, I can't agree with you more. I think lately a pattern I've noticed is business leaders everywhere are like obsessed with implementation and execution, but at the expense of uh, reflection and contemplation. So when Very we true. contemplate making wellness contagious, What's the one big thing? Any business leader watching or listening to our podcast today, what's the one big thing they got to really pay close attention to specific to their organization, Robin? Well, I think, of course, from a leadership perspective, it's always about, are you walking the talk? You know, are you the prime example of somebody who does make wellness contagious, that does value um, happiness, health, and productivity all in the same, un, under the same umbrella. Because these things are not separate, right? They're, they are, they are all um, interconnected, if you will. So of course, we need to look at ourselves and say, you know, am I taking the time to really think 
about what, uh, what we're doing here, what our culture is like, uh, what the processes are, are they required? Or do we need to deal with somebody at the individual level versus blanking it to everybody else? It's looking at how we're operating within our organizations. But again, this is where my whole philosophy is about taking the time to do that. What I can't help but ask, and I think this will help bridge the understanding for anyone watching or listening. What was the epiphany for you? What made you realize? What was the specific example? I mean, I know you've got a degree in psychology. Robin, I know you've got lots of experiences and background in HR, but was there a specific moment with, let's say, one client or one individual that was the light bulb moment, if you will, where you said, hey, organizations need this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's been a combination of all of my experience, which is why I launched my business 10 years ago in, you know, working with different organizations as the disability management consultant within these businesses, recognizing that people were coming to me asking, you know, how do I support someone who's, who's challenged with their mental health or who may be struggling with depression and anxiety, and I didn't have any training around this. Mm -hmm. So I'm being asked to give advice about something that I know nothing about. And what really the light bulb moment for me was as supervisors, managers, leaders were coming to me asking me, like, what do I need to do here? I don't I don't know what the next steps are. Um, I had to go out and get that education and training to learn exactly that. What does need to happen? What is the formula um, for working in challenging situations, particularly where mental health and mental illness is being challenged in a workplace. Um, that those are that was what I didn't know how to do. So I took the initiative really to um, go out and make sure that I had this training, uh, especially mental health first aid training, which is a program that you know, of course, I facilitate and instruct. To me, if people don't know about how to take care of their mental health or to support people who are struggling with their mental health, they're they're going to just try to do what they think they should do. Um, which typically, interestingly enough, isn't the approach that works. And so without that formal training and that formal education and knowledge to really not only understand the theory behind it, but the practical application of that mental health first aid formula, that for me was the shift. So when I took that program and I started implementing what I had learned, I very quickly noticed a change in the results in a change in the outcomes, in the change in how people were responding to me, um, in, in even taking um, information was being received totally differently uh, when I was applying this formula. So the, to me, it's education and training and knowledge, right? We, we just don't know what we don't know. And of course we try to do the best that we can, but when there's a proven formula, um, that we can learn and we can apply in these situations where we think, oh my gosh, I don't know how to handle this, then it makes life so much easier, mm. right? Is there a specific example you could walk us through? Don't, I mean, obviously not betraying any confidences, make up fictitious names, Joe, Mary, whatever, that, that and a real situation, how this uh, approach was implemented and, the, and then the result. Yeah, so I mean, in any of the conversations, when somebody is struggling with their mental health, um, it's often a big step in order to actually express that they are struggling, right? So the formula includes creating this safe environment where people are able to speak freely, but they have to have this connection and the trust in order to feel that they can do that. So within organizations, depending on the trust levels that people have, they may or may not come forward. Now, in the case where people do come forward and they share what they're experiencing, then we have to look at assisting that person without judging their experience. This is really, really important because our natural instinct is that we want to create a story around how the person got there. Uh, we come up, we fill in the blanks with, with facts that, that we believe might be the truth, but aren't. Uh, we just come up with these ideas that, you know, this person got here because of this. And really, it doesn't even matter how the person got to where they're at. If they're struggling in a workplace or they're struggling with their mental health, we want to be in a position to best be able to assist them. So 
facing the person with without judgment is part of that formula. Um, the minute we have judgment, of course, there's major stigma associated with that. And what happens is it changes the dynamic of the conversation. So the minute that people feel judged, they will not open up to you at that point because they feel like you're going to throw a solution at them. Um, you, you're going to take, you're going to look at it from the approach of wanting to solve their problem when in fact, that's not what they need at that particular moment in time. What they need is somebody to listen and truly accept them for what they're experiencing in the moment. Uh, another part of that formula is really, you know, not telling someone what to do. Most people hate being told what to do, especially when it comes to their overall mental health and well-being. So if you have somebody who's really struggling, which, you know, this is the this is really applying that formula, you want to be able to ask them, you know, what have they learned about? What have they tried? The power comes from asking the right questions. So it doesn't come from giving people advice because most people are going to turn away from that. They're not going to be interested in hearing what you have to say. Why? Because people don't like being told what to do. So they want to be able to come up with their solutions through this process of asking appropriate questions. You, you had a question I see there. Well, I, I'm just, I'm trying to ask the right question right now. So yeah. can you make it, can you, uh, it just hit me, Robin. And that's why I love this topic. Can you give us like a, a, a good example and a bad example? Like in, in real life situations, what's the bad example of telling people what to do, basically? Yeah, Deal, yeah. Dealing, dealing, you know, let's face it, we're in a bit of a minefield with mental health, no pun intended, but what's sure. the bad example? Yeah. And, and maybe what's the good example? Maybe you could role play it on me or something, however you want to do it. But just, I think that would help our audience really understand the contrast. Yeah. So, so a bad example would be somebody comes to you and they say, I'm really struggling. And you say something along the lines, like, well, what do you mean? Like what's going on? And they say, well, you know, uh, my workload's really heavy. Um, I'm not being, I can't catch up. I, I got too much on my plate. Um, my inbox is overflowing. I'm my inbox is overflowing. I'm totally uh, overwhelmed. I'm feeling yeah. all these pressures from family members. Robin, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm, I'm really struggling right now. Well, you know what? That's the situation that we're in and you're just going to have to deal with it. <laughs> that would be the... Bad, Bad example. example. <laughs> okay. 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 Right. Or yeah. a lot, I hear a lot of people say, well, you know what? It's really competitive out there and we got to stay on top of our game. And you know, you're just going to have to find a way and figure it out. Like we all do. Right. So I just heard <laughs> in my metacognitive mind, I heard suck it up buttercup. That's right. That's what I heard. That, that's it. What, what should I have heard from the words of a professional. So let's role play this out. So you're coming to me, say, say what you said to me again. Oh, I'm just, I don't know where to start, Robin. My inbox is overflowing. I got more client issues. I've got stuff going on all over the place. I'm, I'm spinning plates like a circus act and it's all out of control. And, and I'm just getting absolutely overwhelmed like George Clooney in the perfect storm facing that hundred foot wave. What do I do? So how long have you been feeling this way? you know, for a few months now, I'm losing sleep. I'm, I'm, I'm waking up in the middle of the night. I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, different issues, business issues in the middle of the night. And it's got to stop. I, I need a break from all this. So do you feel like you're taking care of yourself? Well, I'm, I'm doing my best, but it's, it's, it's impossible to find the time. So do you feel that the time that you would invest in that might help you to feel better? If you took some time for you, do you think that would help? But I can't invent more time, Robin. I'm, I'm, I don't have enough time as it is. I'm, it's not 24, seven, eight days a week. It's 36, nine, nine days a week. What do I do? So what do you think about maybe tracking your time for over a couple of days and see where you're spending most of it so we can look at your priorities? So in other words, what I'm hearing on the good example is you are probing deeper to find out the root cause. Is that what I'm hearing? 
that's it. That's it. And you're getting that person to think about some of the ideas around your questions, right? So are you taking care of yourself is a great question to ask somebody, right? Mm -hmm. And they, they, you know, depending on the flow of that conversation and, and their response, ultimately they may come to that realization that no, I'm not. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so in saying things like there's no time in the day and I mean, that's, that's not true for most people. It's how we spend our time, but that requires looking at how we're doing it, right? How, how do we use our time? You know, have we put importance on our work as being everything and nothing else? There's no balance. There's nothing else is, takes uh, any precedence, right? We have to get to that place where people begin to realize on their own without being told that there are opportunities to shift, but it's within the power of the person to recognize that and come to that conclusion on their own. So you want to ask these questions in order to create the conversation. It's very different than giving somebody advice and telling somebody what to do, right? Which is typically what our auto, automatic autopilot response is to do. We just want to problem solve it quickly. We want that person to shift from where they are without acknowledging where they are and what they're experiencing. And we just want to get on with things. And it's interesting, you know, when I teach the mental health first aid, I, I give people the opportunity to go through this process of really self-reflection and say, you know, what are the frequency of your thoughts? What are the things you're most thinking about? How much time are you spending thinking about these things? And what is the outcome? of you thinking and spending so much time on these things, right? And that's gonna cause people to feel and behave uh, or act, think and feel in a completely different way. And once you raise the awareness around these things, then people start to go, oh, wait a minute, I do have more control over how I'm thinking, acting and feeling than I ever realized, but I didn't take the time to, to do that. Mm -hmm. at, at one time, Robin, any conversation about mental health, especially in a professional environment, was considered taboo. Uh -huh. Is that still the case or are we moving the yardsticks down the field somewhat? Yeah. So the Canadian Mental Health Commission of Canada has said that we have made about 10 years of gains in the mental health industry, believe it or not, because of the pandemic. Why is that true now? So what has happened in the last couple of years is it's laid the playing field for everybody. So it used to be before the pandemic, you know, if somebody was struggling with their mental health, they were, they often were very quiet about it. They weren't sharing, uh, you know, they weren't talking with others about it, of course. Uh, they were trying to manage it largely on their own. But the pandemic has really caused all of us meaning every single person on the planet to be challenged to some degree with their mental health. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody has a mental illness. I don't mean that. Some people will, some people won't, and that's okay. But every single person in the last couple of years has absolutely been challenged with their mental health. And because of that, it has become so much easier to talk about it because everyone is having, while a different experience, also a similar experience. It, it, there's an expression since the pandemic, and I'd be fascinated to hear your twist on it, where we're not all in the same boat. We're all in the same ocean and all of our boats are very different. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. So depending on your resiliency, um, your stress management, your coping, all of these things, of course, come into play um, in how you navigate it through the last couple of years. But I think it's very important to recognize and acknowledge that it has been very challenging for most. Um, this is not this is unprecedented times that we're living through. So there is no textbook or course. Uh, that has been written on how to survive mentally through a global pandemic. It hasn't been created yet. Maybe it will be one day, but um, at this point in time, there's no manual that you can go to and, and that tells you, you know, here's here's the process and here's the steps you take to get through a global pandemic, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and, and as a student of applied history, meaning where can we go back in time and figure out lessons from the past to apply insights today and into the future, I'm curious, uh, while there's no manual, are there principles, Robin, that people can use to navigate uh, through this? Yeah, I mean, I always am an advocate for having a self-care strategy. And in the absence of that, it goes back to, you know, sort of what I was saying earlier, that if we don't think about how we're doing, then we just tend to keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. And, and here's something that a lot of people don't know. We think between 60 to 70,000 thoughts in one day, and 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts that we had the day before. So if we don't start changing how we're thinking about our mental health, not just our mental health, but everybody's mental health, right? Because we certainly want to prevent any further mental health challenges from occurring. I mean, that's what I'm all about. I'm about prevention, right? I don't want to see things get worse. I want to see things get better. And we can do that by encouraging and supporting everyone by recognizing that we, while we do have different experiences, we are not alone um, through going through this experience. And that, you know, it's, it's interesting because I, I was facilitating mental health first aid training uh, virtually over the last couple of years. And everyone said the same thing. They felt like they were going crazy. Mm -hmm. They felt like they were going crazy. And, and it's, that's a very common um, feedback that I heard from so many people and the reason that people were feeling that way is because the brain doesn't like uncertainty. And if you understand that about the brain, it can feel very chaotic when we can't predict or forecast what's coming next. So when people said, you know, I felt like I was losing my mind, I was going crazy through the pandemic. And, and you know, of course, that would vary. Some days would be better and, and other days would be worse. But, the, you know, there's this phrase in the industry that um, or this wording that came out through the pandem pandemic called the COVID coaster. So people oh. felt like they were on the COVID coaster, this roller coaster of emotions where seemingly you know, one day they felt really great to the next day, not feeling good at all, feeling like they could, you know, barely get out of bed. And they weren't understanding why that was really happening. And why it was happening is because our brain doesn't really doesn't like uncertainty. It has a very difficult time when it can't predict. And what happens with certainty is that the brain feels safe. So there's a knowing there, right? I can rely on this information and, and that feels better. But as we have realized through the two years and all the constant changes and the unknowns and the, you know, that really put people into a tailspin, if you will, around their mental health. I can't help but ask, did you yourself experience the COVID coaster? I did. I absolutely what did. And what it's happened? It, well, I had days where I felt really good, where I could, you know, I had my A game on, my work was really flowing well, I, you know, solution, I was problem solving and solutions were coming easily to me. And then there were days where I was like, I hit the alarm on my phone, I didn't want to get out of bed, I felt exhausted, I felt heavy, I felt like everything was a lot of work, I felt like everything was hard, um, the boredom in the pandemic really got to me. I felt like my life was becoming very routine and I had to consciously make choices to continue to mix it up. So I wasn't just living the same day over and over and over again, which, which was depressing, right? Because all of those things that we love to do, going out, being with people, seeing family, seeing friends, uh, going to restaurants, traveling, all of these things, um, that make up such a huge part of our overall health and well-being was taken away. So now you have those things removed, those things that so very much I think we've realized keep us well. We have to now change what we're doing and that, that constant trying to figure it out, like what's going to work today, um, was, was a very big challenge for me, you know, and even switching from being in person to doing virtual you know, I would do a three hour mental health first aid workshop virtually, and I had seemingly no energy 
in the afternoon. I could hardly work. I could hardly do anything. So it took a lot out of me and it took a lot of, lot more um, to try and engage people. And, you know, you're not working in the same way. And, you know, over time I could see, you know, people would be turning their, their picture off on their Zoom. They no longer wanted to kind of show up and, um, conversations, you know, you're trying to get people's engagement and, and, and you could see people were tired. They didn't have it in them to participate in the same way. So all these things were sort of happening. And, you know, it, at, at home, you've got children, you've got a spouse, you're all trying to work in this, in the same, under the same roof. Um, there's definitely more fighting in our household than there has been before. And I think, you know, patience was getting thinner and, all of these things take a toll. And, but, but I, what I believe is important is to acknowledge that and try to shift and recognize, again, this comes back to that metacognition piece, right? What could I do differently? And throughout the pandemic, I had to change how I was doing some of those things. And it was that awareness and it was that reflection on what was working, what wasn't working. What do I have to do differently to make sure that I don't burn out or become completely depleted. And ultimately that meant putting me first, which for so many people is such a hard thing to do because it's, it, you know, we, we often perceive it as being selfish, but ultimately it's the thing that saves you. Right. So I had to say no on, on, you know, to certain requests. I had to start getting outside more. I had to start becoming more active than I was becoming active. Um, all of these things, you know, I had to make these shifts slowly as I went. Otherwise I knew, of course, based on my experience and my, my you know, teachings, I knew where I was headed if I didn't make those changes. So the, the, the whole self-care thing brings up another interesting question, Robin. Love to hear your thoughts on how that is perceived, interpreted, and acted upon differently between men and women. Well, between men and women, I mean, it's, I think for both, it can be seen as selfish. Um, I don't make the distinction there. I think taking time for ourselves has, we, it's just been put on the back burner for so long. And I think everyone is so busy. We, we have such a busy lifestyle, most of us, right? And um, we pick up more and more and more. And, and I mean, some people really thrive being busy, but I have noticed that people can only sustain that for a certain period of time. Um, men in particular, I see, you know, more workaholics, I'll say in, in men, that's been something that I've observed and noticed. Um, but, you know, still, I think that it's, it's this overall idea that it is selfish to take time for yourself or to express what your needs are. And part of that, again, goes back to the stigma around, you know, we're not, we can't be perceived as being weak. Mm. We, we have to, we have to make it look like we can handle everything, especially in a leadership level, right? I mean, people have these expectations of you that you have it together, that you know what you're doing, and that comes with the job. <laughs> it's, it, whether it's, you know, real or not, that's people, their perception is that you've got it together, you're, you know. And that's, we don't always have it together, but I think the first step is actually acknowledging, acknowledging that, that we don't necessarily have it together all the time, that we are human, we are going to struggle. Um, but when it comes to self-care, I think it's for both genders, really, it's about changing how we perceive self-care and recognizing that until we put ourselves first, everything else will be harder in our lives. And once we start putting ourselves first and making time for ourselves, then your stress goes down, your health and wellness improves, your relationships get better, your productivity gets better. All of these things ripple out in a more positive way when we, when we look after ourselves. The funny thing is, is that our society just doesn't encourage that. Mm. It's, it's this idea of like the hustle and just being busy and just taking on more and more and more and more. Well, we know that that eventually leads to burnout for most people. Um, I don't know what the exact stats are relative to men and women, but they're there. They're definitely there. And you, I mean, you certainly can't run a business or do anything if you're exhausted. 
right? I, I, I want to explore a little deeper this self-care strategy because the metaphor that comes to mind, it's the airplane. You know, the, when the plane goes down, what do they tell you? Get yeah. your own oxygen mask on first. You're That's right. no good to anyone unless you've got an oxygen mask on. So right. metaphorically, Robin, what's the oxygen mask for self-care? Is it still a case of some of the old stuff is the good stuff like exercise and meditation, but love to hear your thoughts on specific examples of self-care. Yeah. I mean, definitely there's three areas that if people had these things in balance, they would ultimately improve their overall well-being. Number one being diet, of course, right? Nutrition, look, have a look at what you're eating. Uh, number two is exercise. So exercise, of course, gets, gets rid of the cortisol, the stress um, hormones that are circulating in the body and dumps endorphins, which are the feel good chemicals, right? Changes how you feel, changes how you think, changes how you manage stress. I mean, how many of us have gone and done like a really great workout or done an activity, physical activity, and after the activity is over, we feel like we can take on so much more because we've dumped all that cortisol, the stress hormone. I mean, you ask anybody how they feel after they've done some exercise, they always feel better, right? So it's making the time for exercise. The last one, of course, is sleep. So you got to get your sleep in check. You can't be looking at your cell phone, you know, two minutes before you turn the light off and go to bed because that's going to keep your brain active through the night. And that's where you can't shut off, you know, those, that thought process. So, mm -hmm. you know, do you have a specific routine for relaxing? And this is hilarious because when I do workshops with people, you know, I'll give them a tool and a technique for getting into a state of relaxation. And it's almost like people have forgotten what it feels like to totally relax. You know, it's funny when you ask people when they go on vacation and they go away for a week, I hear so many people say to me, you know, I should have picked 10 days or 12 days because it took me about four days, three to four days just to unwind, mm -hmm. to be able to enjoy the vacation. So we know how it feels, but we forget, we forget. And when we're relaxed, and we know how to do that and get into those states, we start to recharge. I mean, it's like your cell phone. I always say to people, you wouldn't let your, the battery on your cell phone go to zero ever, right? Nobody ever lets, they're making sure that they have extra chargers and, <laughs> and uh, they, they, they'll never let that battery get to zero, but are they doing the same for themselves, right? Yeah, well, I, I so just to restate, the old stuff is still the good stuff right? The diet, yeah. the exercise, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. However, part and parcel of the leadership standard is we're always looking to, you know, raise the standard to achieve higher standards. Mm -hmm. Robin, there's one technique that I would call it your superpower. Now, our uh, intrepid researcher and producer, Stephen Christofferson, uh, went above and beyond to figure this out. And so I want you to speak to the uh, superpower, the technique, the self-care strategy you have with your own Robin Bender version of carpool karaoke. How much does singing in the car help with your mental health? It helps me tremendously. Yeah, singing helps me to feel good. I mean, I can't really carry a tune. Um, yeah. But but it doesn't matter, right? It's those feel good activities. So that we're help parked. You. We're, 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 let's just yeah. say we're at the traffic light. I'm yeah. in one car, you're in the next car. What's the first song that you're singing? Oh, the first song, um, probably good morning. I love good morning. But well, hum of, give us a rendition right now. Oh boy. <laughs> oh, um, okay. Good morning. Na, 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 good morning. Na, 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 good morning. Na, 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 it's going to be a great day today. Good morning. There we go. <laughs> My point is that goofy as that sounds, that might be the time, you know, that I, I can just imagine, Robin, so many tensions, the ability to laugh at ourselves, I guess, is what it really drives to psychologically, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I don't know anyone who doesn't feel some release when Phil Collins comes on the playlist in the air tonight <laughs> and they do the big drum solo in the car. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, music. I mean, it's it's funny because a lot of people, when I ask them what self care tools they used in the last couple of years, do you know that music was one of the number one things that people used in order to change their mood and shift how they feel? Oh, I'm I'm not surprised yeah. at all. Yeah. So yeah. it was almost like a an unconscious like going to that people because I asked people you know what were the tools that you used to get through it because we all did things whether we were conscious of them or not and mm. what were those things that people did so singing for sure right having dance parties at home mm -hmm. that was another one mm -hmm. uh, yeah listening to music playing music learning a, another uh, musical instrument or taking up a musical instrument was a common one as well so mm -hmm. lots of different things that people do well, and I'm just piecing the science bits together a little bit, you know, which is yeah. the 70,000 thoughts a day on autopilot, 90% tend to be negative or self-defeating, whatever it is, right? There's yes. a, it's a high percentage. But if you could sing Mamma Mia, here I go again, my, my, how, like, <laughs> I, I would guess that would break the flow right there, would it not? Yes. Yeah, so all you need to do is introduce new thoughts that you haven't been thinking the day before. Now, again, this requires a level of awareness when you're applying that science, that metacognition. You have to take the time to think about what you think about. And that means introducing a new thought, just like what you just did there, right? You're breaking the pattern. Mm -hmm. And when you break the pattern, you start to pay attention more. And that's what you want to do with your overall health and well-being, how you think, how you act, and how you feel. And if you don't do that, what tends to happen is you default into the same habits, the same um, routines over and over and over again. So if you think about that, if you're a person, for example, that has a lot of anxious thoughts, you're having worst case scenario thoughts in your head, then ultimately, how is that going to translate into how you feel? and how you're gonna behave throughout the day. So imagine a boss who's constantly having thoughts of the worst case scenario in their mind, how that's gonna influence the entire workforce or the organization. What do well, you think is gonna happen as a result of that line of thinking of repetitive thinking? How does that ripple onto everyone else? Here's an interesting thought. And it's just, you know, because of the magic of social media, which we'll talk about in a minute, but um, Stephen Christofferson, our ACE producer, just texted me this. According to a survey by Bamboo HR, 82% of Gen Z employees want mental health days. How common is this now, Robin, in the organizations that you're working with? And, and how does a leader, any business leader watching or listening right now successfully roll out mental health days if they don't already? Yeah, mental health days, I mean, people have categorized them as sick days without explanation. I mean, that's that's another way of saying mental health day, right? Um, how do you implement it? Well, you, you just do. <laughs> you decide that it's good for people to give them that opportunity and trust that they're going to use the time um, in a way that serves their overall well-being. Uh, you have to look at it that way. And you have to implement it with that with that thought in mind, not that it's going to be abused. Um, that's usually a thought that people come up with and are hesitant about doing. Uh, but if you know, if you look at, you know, what is your um, absenteeism rate? Mm. You know, we know that companies that implement these these sort of um, mental health days or sick days without without explanation have lower rates of absenteeism. I mean, that's, that's been proven. So you're, you're giving people time um, that they can use when they need to use it in order to, you know, whatever they need to do for themselves to improve their overall health and well-being. Um, if, if giving them that decreases your absenteeism level, then you're actually saving money. Hmm. I'm going to connect a, a few dots here. I, I loved your analogy about the iPhone and the battery. No, no one. And let's face it. What are we now as, as humans in, in humans all over the world? We're, we're just people who transport phones. I think Jerry Seinfeld made it, made a crack about that. Not too long ago. That's all we do. We just, we're humans who now carry phones and we worship our phones and we, we pay more attention to the battery power on our phone 
than we do on ourselves. I, I, Robin, I think that's a very, very strong mental image that we can all relate to. That being said, what role, especially since the pandemic, has social media played with the COVID coaster? You talked about the COVID mm. coaster and the ups and downs, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on the role of social media? Well, social media is good and bad. <laughs> and it always comes down to the user. And I always say, what is it giving you? How is it causing you to feel? The social media, what happened with social media, of course, in the last couple of years is that's what people were doing. They were spending their time online. They were spending their time on their phones because we were not able to go out and connect face to face. This has led to a lot of addiction, screen addiction. Um, you know, people don't know when to put down their phones. Um, we have, I've heard, and I don't know the actual stats on this. I've heard that the attention span of, of the average person now is 12 seconds. Mm. So people will go and check their social media and then they'll go back again and back again and back again and back again. And, you know, I always say to people, if you were spending the amount of time on self-care that you did on your cell phone, how different would you feel? Right. It's, it's like our screen time has gone up exponentially, um, but it's becoming aware again of the impact that it has on you. So I have a love hate relationship with social media. You know, I've connected with amazing people. Um, I've, you know, implemented new ideas and had partnerships and all kinds of things as a result of it. Um, but I also know when it's starting to take a toll on me because why I pay attention to it. And then it requires, again, having a new thought about social media. Do I need to minimize the time that I'm on it? Do I need to have a look at how often? What am I looking at? Why am I looking at it? Again, it comes back to asking those very important questions of yourself and knowing how it's influencing how you feel, right? And then making, of course, the decision, which is a decision, um, when you look at it, how often, all of those mm. things, right? But the problem is so many of us have become addicted that we don't know when to put it down any longer. We don't know when mm. to stop. So yeah, that, of course, will take a toll on your mental health in the long run. No question. It's a, uh, I love that phrase, screen addiction, just like all the other addictions. Why wouldn't there be screen addiction? Um, that being said, you, you mentioned social media very much as a double-edged sword because the truth be known, I mean, here we are live on LinkedIn. And I think this is some of the good that social media offers. Social media has the power to actually spread good messages, important messages, meaningful messages, stories, and insights. Is that part and parcel of what people can do as well, um, Robin, is, is use it more as a force for good? Absolutely. 100%. I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's really, if we're not using it for that, then what are we doing? Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> exactly. So I want to uh, take um, just a minute or two here, Robin, to... Um, ask you a few questions. It's, it's a standard question we ask on the leadership standard. Okay. Okay. And, and, and so a more universal question uh, we ask it every time. And I, I, I want to let to give you the, the time to answer it from your own uh, experiences. So in a nutshell, how would you Robin Bender define leadership? Leadership is being who you truly are. Expand on that. Um, I think it's knowing who, I, I think it's knowing yourself fully and completely. I think it's knowing your, your faults, if you will, or your challenges, um, being honest about who you are, where you need to make improvements, um, where you could do better. Um, leaders, you know, in my view, leadership is about being the example of what you want to see, right? So if you want to have, again, healthy staff, healthy employees, healthy business, healthy culture, the question comes down to, is that who you are? Are you embodying what you want to see 
in the world? Are you embodying mm -hmm. and, and speaking your truth around those things? Um, ultimately, that that's what it comes down to. It's it's really knowing who you are and and being honest about it. On Robin, on your own leadership journey, mm -hmm. they say there's no better teacher than failure. Is there something you failed at? You wish you had a do over. Oh, I've made so many mistakes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've, I, I, I think the biggest lesson that I've learned, especially, you know, running a business, I, I believed for so long I could do it all. And I believed, you know, I'm a, I'm a lifelong learner. I love learning new things, but there's people out there that can do these things better than you. And that was my biggest shift in business. I'll tell you when, especially when I first started in my business, I was trying to take on anything. Like I'm not an accountant. I'm not a marketer. <laughs> I, I'm not, you know, I don't do budgets. Well, there's, there's all these things that, you know, you hire people for because they, they know these things, they know them better than you. Mm -hmm. And I think admitting that like there are, you know, you hire people that are better at these things than you are because they will make your organization better instead of this belief that, well, I just need to do everything myself because I'll know how it's going to be done. And I trust how I do things. So I'm just going to take on everything. That for me was one of the biggest shifts that I ever, I had to like drop my ego and say, you know what? Time to let go of trying to do it all. On a more personal level, is there a client story from all the organizations you've worked with? Is there a client story that's really touched your heart? Yeah, I had one client who wanted to make organizational change um, throughout their organization, and they had 1,400 staff. And they really, they, they saw it as a sort of a big, big rock to move. They want, they really wanted to shift things in, in a more positive direction and they weren't sure how to go about doing it. And they had hired me in to do some training with their staff. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because some of the simplest solutions make the biggest difference. And one of the things that I did with this organization is I had everybody wear an elastic band. It's like the cheapest solution that you could possibly <laughs> implement. And what I asked the staff to do as I ran them through the learnings, the teachings of, you know, really this, this idea of metacognition, think about what you're doing before you do anything. Take time to pause before you act, right? Really sit with how you feel. And I gave everyone an elastic band to wear on their wrist. And all the staff wore one. And I said, it's just a simple tool to remind you of what you've learned so you don't forget. And when you go back into your workplace, you know, all of you will be wearing an elastic band on your wrist and you all know what it means. So nobody's going to be left out. Nobody, you know, you're all in it together. And what I encouraged the workplace to do, the workforce to do, was when they were in a challenging situation to take a pause. And to use this idea of metacognition and think about what kind of outcome they wanted to have or how did they want the conversation to go to look at that elastic band and remember what they had been taught. And this changed the entire organization. And it's one of the most proudest um, client outcomes that I ever had, mostly because you know, it was, it was great to do the training with everybody, of course, but it was a very simple solution that didn't cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And my message, you know, to people is, especially leaders, is it doesn't have to cost a lot of money <laughs> to change the culture. It doesn't have to be these big, big wellness initiatives and programs. All it has to be is encouraging people to raise their awareness and get them thinking more about how they think, act, and feel. And if you can do that, you can make huge gains, right, in your business, in your culture, in your productivity, and in everything, because now you've encouraged people to do it. You've, you've got everyone on board with it. And most people can't disagree with 
the fact that when mental health improves for everybody, Hmm. then it's a better place to work. It's a happier place to be. It's a more productive environment. Ideas and creativity flow out of that kind of culture and that kind of business. But if we're trying to control everybody and we're trying to shove policies down their throat, (laughs) these are the strategies that don't work. But I think you have to have enough experience, which I'm lucky enough to have, having worked with so many organizations. You, you, you know what works and you know what doesn't work after seeing it for so long. You know, Robin, they say it's lonely at the top. Purely from the CEO perspective, what have you discovered about how the CEO deals with their own mental health when they feel like they can't really talk about it to anyone. So how do they deal with their own mental health? So it's getting those tools um, that help them to change their thoughts, right? So having that thought that I'm alone in this is simply a thought. It's all about introducing new information and new thoughts, right? And this can be done in many different ways. And ultimately how we think and how we feel Um, creates our state of being. So if we have that awareness to start thinking about what we think about, then here's an opportunity to change how we ultimately feel and how we act. But you've noticed something about how CEOs respond to this question, but no one's asking them. Is that that what I understand to be true? Oh, uh, yeah. People are not asking the question necessarily. And um, that's what I've noticed. Many people, you know, many leader CEOs are asking the question of their staff or checking in with their managers and supervisors. And yet nobody is asking them the question how they're managing with their own mental health. And so, you know, I have had uh, lots of trainings where, you know, the president, I've said flat out to the president of the company, you know, has anyone come to you and checked in with to see how you're doing and how you had to navigate, you know, the last couple of years? And of course, ultimately, the answer is no. Uh, nobody thinks to necessarily ask the leadership or the CEO or president of our organization how they're doing, because there's these assumptions people make that, well, they, they know how to handle this. They're, they're dealing with it fine. It's, it's an expectation. And often it's an unrealistic expectation. Um, that we put on leaders that, you know, they've got it all figured out when, when they don't. On a more personal note, speaking of leadership, one of the things I always ask, like to ask is about influences specifically from books, thought leaders, authors. If I was to name you your all time three favorite leadership books, what would they be? Yeah, so I mean, I've, I my leadership um, interests in books always changes, and so it's of course been you know many years of looking at different ones. And uh, three of my favorites would be Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself, uh, This Is Your Brain on Food, and <laughs> Yourself. Wow. <laughs> okay, that's 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 a far cry from the days of Stephen Covey and Good to Great, but well said. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> If, if there was a biopic on your life, who would play you in the starring role? Oh, boy. Who would play me? Tough. I think my sister. Oh, really? Yeah. Is she an actress? No. <laughs> but she could be one. <laughs> she, a lot of people think we're twins. Oh. Perfect. Uh, Robin, on a scale of one to 10, how weird are you? Ten. <laughs> okay. Why do you say that? Uh, I, I feel like I um, think differently than a lot of people, uh, mm-hmm. especially in the, in the field that I'm in. Um, I've always been about prevention. Mm-hmm. Um, I always am about, uh, you know, not being reactive and trying to find proactive solutions. Tell us something that's true that almost nobody agrees with you on, but you know it to be true. Um, that honesty is the best policy. And 
if there was one thing you know for sure in terms of the best advice you've ever heard and you have actually followed, what would that be? It could be from something from your childhood, from your grandparents or a, a teacher at school, a coach, anyone. What's the, what's the best advice you've ever heard and acted on? Always follow your intuition. I think Jewel had a song called Intuition. <laughs> could, could be on your car radio someday. Yeah. Robin, it's, it's been a real pleasure to have you here on the Leadership Standard. For those who have been listening and watching, um, how do they get a hold of you? What's the best way to reach out? Yeah, so the best way is robin at megahealth.ca. You can email me, um, as well as my website, www.megahealth.ca megahealth.ca. It's, it's great. And, and again, Robin, we really do appreciate you uh, joining us here and uh, uh, being part of this program we call the Leadership Standard. So on that note, uh, we do, and I know Robin's going to go back and probably later today enjoy some nachos and guacamole, because that's what it said she really likes to do uh, when she's not singing uh, in the car, uh, doing carpool karaoke. Um, so many uh, takeaways from today. The autopilot, uh, how 70,000 thoughts per day are just circulating through the brain and, and so many of them on autopilot that can take us on that COVID coaster uh, and, and detract from uh, a self-care strategy that is really like uh, making sure your battery is plugged in just like your iPhone or your Android device, whatever uh, you happen to use. What was it that Robin shared that meant the most to you? Feel free to reach out. Send us a note here to uh, the Leadership uh, Standard because uh, we'd love to hear from you. And on that note, we do so appreciate you watching, listening. We encourage you to like, comment, and share uh, with as many people in your social networks and, and use social media for good uh, so that we might inspire other leaders to grab hold of the clutch and kick it up a notch um, and, and embrace uh, all the prosperity that's out there in this new frontier. So on behalf of everyone at Tech Canada, executive producer, Mark Johnson, number 13, uh, Alexander, Stephen, Kat, I'm Gary Maxwell. Thank you for being part of the Leadership Standard.